If little vampire children are coming and biting at your heels, kill them! RMC is supported by MonsterJoysticks.com. Level up your retro gaming with their joysticks featuring genuine Sanwar arcade parts. And OneClickPrint.com for your photos on canvas, acrylic, gifts and more. Local craftsmen and global delivery. Our guest today really does create worlds. As far back as 1979, he was hanging Ziploc bags of his new game, A Calabeth, in a computer store in the hope that he might sell a few copies. Oh, there it is. <laughs> and little did he know he was helping to shape not just a video game genre, but an entire industry. Here to reflect on his massive influence on the art form, it's Richard Garriott. Welcome, sir. Oh, thank you so much. It's great to be here with you. Richard, first things first, are you fit and well in the midst of this pandemic that we're going through? Well, yeah, thank you for asking. But uh, yes, uh, you know, my family and I, uh, we're here at ground zero, you might say, at least in the United States, we're here in New York City. So uh, we have locked the doors and uh, I rarely go outside except get groceries, uh, but we're all doing fine. Uh, we've got a actually, uh, compared to other uh, folks here in town, I think we've got a pretty comfortable, we've got a a roof deck we can uh, uh, escape onto so the kids can play. But yeah, thank you so much for asking. Good to We're doing well, but I know, I know so many other people are, are struggling a lot worse. Mm -hmm. um, Richard, I very much enjoyed your book, which I've got here, Explore, Create, um, which I highly recommend. And you start off very humbly by reflecting on a certain degree of luck in terms of the era that you were born and the opportunities that came your way, including being present at the dawn of personal computers. When did you first have access to a computer yourself? Well, for me, it came uh, uh, during my freshman year in high school. So uh, every year of schooling from kindergarten through graduation, I went to the same uh, school district in Houston, except my freshman year in high school. That, that year, my father, uh, who had been a professor at Stanford University prior to becoming an astronaut, he went back to Stanford University to take some updated electrical engineering courses and took the family with him. And there on Stanford campus, the high school that was largely attended by faculty uh, professors and their, their, you know, their, the kids of, of, of the faculty of Stanford, that, that high school was one of the most advanced, you might, as you might expect, you know, in the country. And, and there I saw not just one, but, you know, not, my, not just my first, but actually a, a whole a bunch of computers. They had a a room full of five or six uh, teletypes, which is what I, I really started my work on. Uh, but they also even had some CRTs, some video display terminals connected to some uh, uh, machines that were used even in their language teaching classes. And so I had this brief but deep exposure there to some of these early computers. And so then when I went back to my schools back uh, in Houston, uh, the school the, the, the school rooms had no computers, but the the faculty had one uh, old teletype, or I guess it was modern at the time, one teletype uh, that no one in the school knew how to use, but I did. And so uh, for the, the remaining three years of high school, I sort of became the school's computer expert uh, as I kind of uh, began to build games uh, there as uh, for the rest of my uh, career, so to speak, at school. Yeah, yeah. Um, you mentioned your father there. He's, he's registered as spending nearly 70 days in space as an astronaut. So w was he quite an influence on your early sort of computer decisions or was he busy astronauting? <laughs> uh, honestly, my dad was pretty busy astronauting. So uh, and, and by the way, you know, in the neighborhood I grew up in, astronauts weren't that uncommon. Sure. Uh, you know, you know my, my right hand neighbor was Joe Ingle, another astronaut, left hand neighbor, Hoot Gibson, another astronaut. You know, I grew up with the kids of all of the famous Apollo astronauts. Uh, and uh, uh, and so, you know, it, in the neighborhood I grew up in, you either were involved in people putting people into space or you were a farmer. And there were there were really nothing in between. So the school I went to was sort of half uh, farmers, you know, the children of farmers, literally, and half the children of NASA astronauts and engineers. Yeah, yeah. And you were fortunate enough to go up into the International Space Station yourself uh, eventually. Um, but was it in those early days, was it kind of a given? Everyone around me is astronauts. So I'll, I'll just do it one day. <laughs> yeah, well, well, what's fascinating about that? It, it, exactly. So I grew up just sort of believing that you didn't have to decide to go. You know, it would just sort of everybody goes. I mean, so I, I never thought as a child that when I grew up, I'm going to be an astronaut because I didn't think you needed to do that. It just sort of was something that was 
presumably going to happen to all of us. And it wasn't until I was about 13 years old, uh, just about just before, uh, but almost at the same time I began to you know be exposed to computers, that one of the NASA doctors who was giving me an eye test said, oh, I see you're going to need glasses. I hate to break it to you, but you are no longer eligible to be a NASA astronaut. And and he, of course, was saying that because, you know, most everybody's not going to be a NASA astronaut. So he did, this doctor didn't think they were saying anything particularly shocking. But to me, I was just kicked out of the club that as far as I knew, everyone else I knew was a member of except me. And so I was crushed. I was hor- I mean, I was literally I went through like the seven stages of grief. You know, I was angry, <laughs> disappointed, you know, resolved to do something about it. Uh, but of course, at the age of 13, you, you, you can't do much about it. But as soon as I started writing computer games and 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 pulling in you know serious money, uh, I immediately began investing towards uh, opening up you know commercial human spaceflight specifically so that I could go. What yeah. sort of period are we talking? Early to mid seventies when you were playing with these yeah, mid, computers? Yeah, yeah, mid seventies. So it was it was nineteen seventy five that I for, was exposed to the teletypes to begin with. Yeah. And uh, two summers later, in the summer of 1977, I uh, took a summer class at the University of Oklahoma. There was a seven-week class for high school students in computer programming and mathematics like statistics and a few other things. And when I arrived at this dorm, which was with about, you know, 50 other kids, co-ed, terrible idea for to send your junior high children to a co-ed seven week summer program, by the way, parents. Um, but, uh, uh, I had a good time, but, uh, the, (laughs) but when I arrived, uh, the other kids were there ahead of me who had already discovered this game, Dungeons and Dragons, and they were going door to door as people arrived and giving them each a name. And when they came to my door, uh, they said, hi. And I said, hello. And they said, hello, you know, nobody from around here says hello. You must be from Britain, so we'll call you British. And I went, well, interestingly, I actually was born in England, so I am a British citizen, even though I clearly do not have a British accent, because uh, since I only lived there for like three months as a baby. Um, but uh, that nickname stuck, and all my early D&D characters became known as British and eventually Lord British. And in fact, presuming this might come up, uh, <laughs> I... I kept here with me this this folder of paper, which you might be able to see says British on it. See, yeah. Has this this is my very first Dungeons and Dragons character sheet that says uh, British right up here in the top. Amazing. So this is literally British and Lord British, my level one mage, my very first ever character sheet uh, on the day that I discovered uh, you know Dungeons and Dragons. So uh, my lawful good magic user. Fantastic. There you go. And in the book, you describe yourself, again, humbly as a good dungeon master, but not the best. You said there were better ones out there, but uh, you obviously had an ability to tell a story, to weave a yarn. Yeah, I think that the thing that I had, you know, there were definitely better storytellers uh, than me in my original group. I think I think what made my group, what, what the, the pivotal role I played in my group was to bring it together. Um, you know, I was uh, throughout school, not just high school, but from kindergarten through graduation from school, I was a big competitor in science fairs. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mm -hmm. in fact, my, my kids are only just now old enough to like to, uh, for me to show off my trophy case of my, of all my science fair, uh, awards. Uh, but the, but the reason I mentioned that is I was good at independent projects. I was good at, you know, just pulling material together and, and, you know, competing, you know, in, in a sense. And so when, after that summer program where I was exposed to d and I came back and I was ready to just do it full time. And so we brought a group together at my, my home, uh, you know, that started as a you know, group of six or eight of us around the dinner table, you know, on Friday and Saturday evenings, but grew to 50 or 60 people every Friday and Saturday night, basically playing all night. My mom would cook food for everybody all night. Uh, she would occasionally play with us. Uh, other parents wondering what the heck is going on over at the Garriott household would come by too, and then they would often get dragged in. Some of our teachers from school got dragged in. It really became this sort of big happening, uh, and I was most all most commonly one of the dungeon masters, and you know, and felt competent at it by all means. Um, but I could go visit some of the other uh, games going on. In fact, there's a, a friend of mine named Bob White, Robert White. Uh, he's one of the people I really admired as a, as a game master who's still a, a friend of mine. Uh, and uh, I could sit you know, and watch him 
you know, spin his tales and just really sit there in admiration of you know what good storytellers there were in this early era. I think that the very earliest era of Dungeons Dragon Dungeons and Dragons I still admire because it seems like the early adopters really were great interactive storytellers. Mm -hmm. As mm -hmm. it became popularized, it became more debates about numbers and die rolls and stuff and layers of rules upon rules, none of which I care about. And uh, 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 but, those, but those interactive storytellers, that was that was the heyday to me. And it's, it's coming back. Actually, I really like the role playing. I think it's uh, even pen and paper role playing is really – uh, come back in recent years in a way that I, I, I admire. I've played more Dungeons and Dragons, which is still not much. I've played more in the last few years uh, than I have in the previous you know decade or two. Uh -huh. And so at some point, your two passions then collided, uh, resulting in a Calabeth. Just talk us through how that happened then. How did your first game? I'm presuming that was your first game. Uh, it did, was. It was, yeah. Yeah, in fact, uh, but I'm going to pull out one more little thing here too that I think I still, I think I still have right behind. Oh, yeah. So... Um, so on that teletype, even at the very, very beginning, even when even at Stanford in that my freshman year, much less by the summer I was playing Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, and definitely once I got back to the, the one teletype my school had and they let me just have my own class with no teacher and no assignments, just go do stuff and show us what you did because they knew I was good at independent projects. I began to, you know, write you know, programs out. You, you've, you've probably seen this before, you know, paper tape spools. So this was this was how these were, uh, you know, the, the games were stored. But immediately, uh, and this would have been in 1977, so by in the fall of 1977, I began to try to recreate this, this pen and paper gaming experience I was having on that teletype computer. And so this, very careful art, little artifact here, this is D and D one. Wow. So written in 1977, this is the actual paper tape spool of the, my very first attempt at taking this kind of, ex, you know, Dungeons and Dragons like experience and, and creating something that would work like it on the computer. And as I was doing this, um, you, you probably remember that, you know, this is in the day long before there were, compilers and editors, text editors or anything of this nature. And so you actually couldn't program even directly on the computer. You actually had to write it out in my case in notepads. In fact, I meant to grab one of those, didn't grab one of my notebooks, but I have, I have all the notebooks. I wrote all these in too, starting with D and D one and you'd write it out and you would debug it in your head. You'd literally be kind of running it over and over again in your head. Uh, and then once you felt that that was right, then you would type it in, to these, you know, straight streams of paper tape, hoping not to make a typo because it's pretty hard to correct a typo when you're punching holes. <laughs> and um, and then you would test run it. And 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 usually when I'd finish one of these, like that one, D&D &D 1, by the time it was more or less finished, often less, you'd learn a lot, you'd throw it away, and you'd start again. And so I wrote D&D &D 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way up to number 28, Wow. Uh, during my last two and a half years of, of high school. And then I made a bet with my father that I could make a, this game work on an Apple II. The Apple II had just come out at that time too. And so he, you know, um, knowing that I probably could pull this off, he agreed that he would split the cost of an Apple II with me if I could, you know, make this role-playing game work on the Apple II. And that's actually what started a Calabeth. And so the the remark statement at the beginning of this code actually says D and D twenty eight B. It was actually a port of my twenty eighth teletype game onto the Apple II. Um, when I did this work before it ever showed up in a Ziploc bag, I had a summer job at a Computer Land store, one of the very first ever PC companies, and it was the owner of that store, a guy named John Mayer who saw me playing with this game in the back room, you know, between shifts and said, Richard, that game is way better than anything we have for sale on the pegboards here at the store. And in fact, you know, we're, we're telling people to buy, spend, you know, two or three thousand dollars on an Apple II like that one right back there, which is right now running this game. Uh, <laughs> He said, you know, we're, we're telling people to spend two or three thousand dollars on that machine to do things like balance their checkbook or keep a recipe card file. And, you know, and this thing you've done is way better than that. You should publish it. And 
So there, there weren't really uh, very many, if you know, there were a couple, but there, were, there really wasn't much to be said for the publishing industry at that moment. And, and how so about, I, sorry, how about video games as the whole? So you were working in computer land. Were there any or many video games hanging up on the pegs in computer land? There were some. In fact, uh, there's a guy named Bill Budge who still works in the industry. Um, and Bill, Bill had done some really uh, stuff that I still admire to this day, way ahead of, frankly, what I could do now, much less even then. Um, and, uh, but, but the majority of games hanging on the pegboard were knockoffs of coin ops. And so for example, uh, not to, not to uh, knock a friend of or somebody I worked with in those early days, Tom Lures, who wrote a game called Appleoids, but it was really asteroids, but with apples, if you follow my, my meaning. And so, and I have a, one of my best friends here in New York city, uh, is, uh, he wrote a, a little, you know, centipede alike game. Uh, that, uh, you know, so, so most of the games th of this era were coin op knockoffs that you could write in a relatively short period of time. You know, my games, even from the beginning were things that took more time. There wasn't much, this was only about seven weeks of work for this one, but that was still a lot back, uh, for its, for its time. Yeah. But I went out and spent what I thought was a huge amount of money, my whole life savings, about $200 on the, literally these Ziploc bags, uh, my, you know, my, my mother calligraphied the Calabath here for the cover, for the cover, a friend of mine who was another employee at the work at the, at the computer land helped me draw with game paddles, the, oh, some wow. art here for the front. <laughs> uh, we, we sat down in the kitchen of my, uh, uh my literally my, uh, home in Nassau Bay and hand stapled together these little instruction booklets. And I hand copied these, uh, discs. This is actually a particularly rare one. This is the dealer demo. It's actually uh, there's, I've never seen one of these uh, in the public, but there were some that were released in the very beginning. So that is an uh, original copy. That isn't one that this you've is recreated. Wow. No, it, this it's, isn't original. It's insanely collectible. It's, it's sort of my holy grail of video games, but uh, I think that's the yeah. closest I'll ever get to one, Richard. <laughs> yeah, and this is, one, this is one, again, that I think has never been out. I mean, I, I of course, you know, kept a few of the originals, so I, I, I still have a few of these. <laughs> These sell for about ten grand a piece they when they do. come for sale on eBay. And you're just waving them around there. <laughs> uh, but this one I've actually never seen in the public hands, so uh, that one's even more rare. Wow, you've got a license to print money there, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, as as long as I don't run out of my my stock of three to five. So yeah. <laughs> and Calabeth was what we'd recognise as an RPG. You mentioned it was competing with very simple arcade games, but it had top-down view and also first-person dungeon views. So would you say it was a technically challenging thing to write? The, the big step was the perspective view and, and right. how that came into being is, uh, and in fact, the reason I was so motivated to put it on the Apple II was, you know, my first Apple IIs uh, I saw at this computer line store where I worked for a couple of years. And as soon as I saw the Apple II, the first of all was real time and, you know, had graphics. Um, I also saw a little game that I have a copy of here somewhere on cassette. So it was even before the disk drive existed. Uh, and the game was called Escape! Exclamation point. And what this game Escape did is it started with a little top view in low res graphics and it, it showed a digging out of a one solution maze. And so I, first of all, I never thought about how do you make a one solution maze. So it was interesting to watch that because you, you dig a tunnel like a snake until you can't go any further. And then you pick a point to branch off of and you keep dig again randomly until you can't go any further. And then you pick a point again and go again until you can't go any further. And if you do that, you, you make a one solution maze. And I was going like, oh, that's fascinating. Now I know how to make a one solution maze. But then what the game did is it basically dropped you into street view to use, you know, Google Maps terms. <laughs> and you would in low res graphics kind of walk through this maze that you had just seen be made. And your goal was to escape it just to get out. And, uh, uh, but it was in sort of perspective, but it was again, very blocky, you know, 40 columns by, you know, 24 lines, uh, uh, you know, block, block graphics, uh, the mathematics, I'm not even sure if they were particularly good or not, but it worked. And so then I said, okay, I need to do that in high res and make my dungeons and monsters and treasure in there. And, uh, so I sat down with my mother who showed, who was an artist and showed me how to draw perspective with a vanishing point and, you know, how to draw diagonal lines, of, you know, like if there are telephone poles on the side of a road, how to use the geometry to make things vanish into the distance. And I used my high school geometry to work out what I thought the sine and cosines would all be to do that math. I then handed it over to my dad and said, dad, before I code this up, this is going to be a nightmare to code in basic. Uh, can you confirm that my math is right? So he, 
he did his own. He actually approached it from a calculus standpoint, but came to the same conclusions that I did. So I at least knew that my equations were sound. And then I sat down to write these incredibly long and complicated, you know, line drawing uh, the math in in complex basic commands, uh, and it worked. And so I finally had this simple, slow, but functioning right here behind me, um, you know, method of drawing 3D. And so uh, I'm pretty sure this is the first ever, you know, 3D role playing game in existence is this one right here. It's, uh, you know, invented from scratch at a day when it was, you know, hardly doable. Mm -hmm. Well, word would spread of your game. Um, you soon found yourself with publisher, uh, I think it was California Pacific, who picked it up. Uh, were you business savvy in choosing them or were you just grateful at this point that there was interest in your game? Oh, frankly, I was grateful there was interest. I, mean, <laughs> I had no idea there could be interest. I had no, you know, I didn't even know there was an industry. And, uh, uh, the, the, the reason why I, I mean, I would have been thrilled no matter who called me, but the reason why I was particularly thrilled that they called me is the only reason I knew who they were is they published Bill Budge's work and Bill Budge was the one person out there who was putting stuff, you know, that I was putting his games and works on the pegboard of that computer land store going, that guy has skills. You know, I'm going like, if I, if I could learn from some master, if I could be inspired by some master, that's the guy. And I still feel that way to this day about Bill Budge. He, he was so far ahead of everybody else. Uh, he remains so far ahead of everybody else that, uh, uh, anyway, I've, I, I enjoyed the, to be able to rub shoulders, uh, uh with him during our, our, our relatively brief time, you know, 40 years ago, uh, you know, at California Pacific. Instantly, what would have been your career choice if you hadn't got into video games? Do you know what you might have done? You know, I honestly have no idea. You know, I, I, I was a terrible student. You know, in fact, in those early days, you know, when I'd be invited back by teachers or other people to come give a talk at school, you know, I'd have to go like, well, I'm not really sure you want me because, you know, I'm a, I was a terrible student. I dropped out of school to go play games for a living. And, you know, and, and by the way, uh, there's still school still at least, you know, 30 years, 40 years ago, still weren't teaching what I do for a living. And so there was very little advice I could give kids in school to about staying in school because that's not what you needed you know, back in those days to, uh, to, to tackle this career. I was an electrical engineering major, but you know, but that's cause I, my, my two, my, my older brother and my father were electrical engineering majors. And so I was just sort of doing it cause it was the thing to do, but it really wasn't what I was passionate about. I mean, I, I knew in college when I was started doing the physics of the interior of a breakdown diode in a chip, I was going like, I am, that is not what I'm going to go do. I'm not going to go <laughs> do the uh, physics of the interior of a chip. That's just not where I was interested in. But, but what I was interested in just wasn't taught. And, and for me, the death nail for school actually came when, uh, you know, so, so through a Calabeth, Ultima 1 and Ultima 2, I was still attending the University of Texas. But the end clearly came when I was programming professionally on the Apple II in assembly language for Ultima II. And at the same time, I was taking an assembly language programming class at UT. And at UT, the class was on a 6809 processor, which was the newer version from the 6502. And uh, so I knew how to program in a 6502, great compared to most people. But I didn't write my class code with the new instructions of the optimized 6809 in it. And so I would often be slower, a little more wasteful in my 6809 code, and I'd get no points knocked off for that. And so I failed my first assembly language programming class at UT while programming in assembly <laughs> language professionally. And I said, okay, I cannot do both of these things at the same time. And so that's when I said, I, I have to leave school. And, and I was thinking it would be sort of a big deal, but when I you know, shared that idea with my parents, my parents were like, well, of course that's the right thing to go do, but... When this windfall ends, when gaming runs its course and, you know, this uh, easy money goes away, you'll obviously go back to school, finish your degree and get a real job. Mm -hmm. I'm surprised so, you didn't just turn turn your game in as your coursework. Here's Ultima 2 <laughs> market. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, the Calabeth is now considered Ultima Zero, I guess, as we come on to the Ultima series. Um, and it's where video gamers first get to meet the character Lord British. So he's cemented. Uh, in video game law, uh, or Lord, is it Canterbridgean? Oh, yeah. As, uh, so, well, that's 
as Chuckles yeah. tells us in Ultima 5. Um, and this was actually used as a marketing hook, wasn't it, by California Pacific to start pushing sales. How did that work? Yeah, well, that's a, in fact, a, what's interesting about where did I just put my, uh, uh, my, uh, my piece of paper here. Yeah. So you'll notice on this, on my blue Ziploc bag version actually says by Richard Garriott. So mm -hmm. it actually, here it says Richard Garriott, but on the, when you boot it up, it, it actually says yet another name, not even Lord British, not Richard Garriott, but it actually says Shamano Soleil de Seal. And that is my SCA character's name. And Lord British is a character in the game, which is also me and my D&D character. And so when California Pacific saw this, like, what is this with Richard Garriott, Lord British, Shamano, explain all this to, to us. And I told them that, well, they're all sort of these different manifestations of me uh, and explained why. They went, well, y you know, uh, if we market this as Richard Garriott, you know, it's, it's a name like anybody else. There's nothing wrong with that name. But – but people weren't using nom de plumes yet. And, uh, and they said, you know, if we use Lord British, it makes some rational sense because you were born there. It's a character in the game. They just, they just liked the whole moniker of it. And so, uh, uh, so yeah, they said, let's, let's erase all those other useless names and uh, let's let Lord British be the, the, the primary author and creator. Okay, but Shamano did make a, an appearance again in uh, yes, later indeed. games. Of course. Um, and so followed Ultima 1 then, the first Age of Darkness. Can we insinuate from the title, the first Age of Darkness, that um, it was your intention to start creating a whole series of games or were you just taking them one at a time? One at a time. Yeah, okay. no. So, yeah, yeah. So, what, in fact, uh, so it wasn't... Uh, uh, it, it, yeah, I, I had... You know, if you think of the ones on paper tape, I was just making them because I wanted to, right? They were just, I'm just making them for fun. And, and even a Calabeth, you know, that wasn't made to make money. That was just me having fun. And, and when it sold pretty well, you know, this, this game sold about 30,000 copies and I made about five bucks a piece. So if you do that math, that's about $150,000 for seven weeks of high school work. And this was at a time when my dad's income as a NASA astronaut was about $65,000 a year. So I almost tripled his income uh, as an astronaut with, you know, seven weeks of after school time. And so I was going like, wow, you know, if I could do this with something that really has no plot to speak of, there's, I mean, uh, there is sort of a way to win, but it was almost an afterthought of just, you know, finish up, kill a bunch of monsters in a row and ta-da, you win. Um, and I said, you know, if I made a game intending for it to be played by the public, um, you know, I could do a much better game. So that's what started Ultima. And, and that one sold even better. And then I said, you know, I've done all this work. I'd, I'd already been working, but the time Ultima 1 came out, I had already been now making games for most of a decade. But they were all in basic. And that was when I said, you know, I'm, if I really were to really wanted to push this machine further, I really need to learn assembly language. So Ultima 2 really was just a, I know I can do better if I start over and do it in assembly language. Well, when I finished Ultima 2, and it was, I think, a measurably and qualitatively better game than Ultima 1, I said, well, yeah, but that's the first assembly language program I ever wrote my whole life. And so it's actually pretty crummy code compared to what I now believe I could write having done it once. And that's what started Ultima 3. And so if you look at this from the teletype to a Calabeth to Ultima 1, 2, and 3, they really are. None of it has to do with marketing. None of it has to do with sales. This is all... I'm literally just going, I now know I can do much better if I start over. That's, that's really it. It's just a, wow, that was, that was fun. I had a good time. People seemed to like it, but I know I can do much better. And so that's really what did all of them through and including Ultima 3. Mm -hmm. And by the time we come to Ultima 3, um, you are publishing that under your own company. So Ultima 2, I think you moved, moved to Sierra. Is that right? Uh, yeah. Well, in fact, there's a, I'll try to be brief on the interesting story for this one. So a Calabeth and Ultima 1 went through California Pacific. Unfortunately, at they, as so many companies in this early industry, were badly mismanaged. Uh, they, uh, they, as so many companies in this early industry, also had serious internal drug problems. Uh, and so basically, they just quit paying everybody, Bill Budge, myself, and others included. So we all had to scatter. That's when I went to Sierra. Uh, Sierra had its own issues. They also quit paying me halfway through the sales period of Ultima 2. 
Uh, I then went to my brother, Robert, and I, who, who was a double E. <laughs> and, uh, uh, he, I had called him up. He also had a business background. I had called him up upon the failure of both California Pacific and Sierra. I called him to help me try to collect from these deadbeats that quit paying me. He tried to help both times unsuccessfully. Uh, but finally, after that, he said, you know, Richard, why don't you and me go into business together? Because, you know, I have a business degree and engineer, engineering degree. I, at the very least, know that when we collect money, I will pay you your cut. So I can't guarantee we'll succeed or fail, but you will get paid for every sale we make. And I said, well, that's a better deal than I've received previously. So let's start our company together. So that's, what, that's really why we started Ultima 3 was really out of necessity of the collapse of other companies. But the result of that was another interesting thing. Not only did, uh, of course, the value of my work become greater because now I own the publisher, um, but it also meant for the first time, if anybody wrote to the company about what they thought about the game, they were writing directly to me. And that was a really important change. Uh, prior to Ultima 3, the only feedback I ever received about my work was through the sales numbers. Mm -hmm. And while that's obviously important and nice to see when it goes well, which it was, uh, starting with Ultima 3, I began to see what people were thinking as they played the game. And I began to notice things like people would say, I love playing the game, but what I really liked doing was killing all of the characters in your games. I like killing all the town people, all the people. Oh, and the person I like killing the most is Lord British. <laughs> And your character. And so people were playing my games not as heroes, but frankly, they were min-maxing the method of play to become as powerful as possible as quickly as possible in order to win as soon as possible, which meant they were actually acting like bad guys as opposed to good guys. And so for me, that was a real revelation. And that's what started the radical change in design that came in with Ultima 4. Mm. It's a common thing, actually, I hear from people that I interview is that there were just, for them, there was just no feedback until they got to the World Wide Web stage and they started to get feedback that way. So you, you got it a lot earlier than, than a lot of other developers by doing that. Um, you also made reference there to the, uh, the prevalence of recreational drug use in the early video games industry um, and the poor decision making or even bankruptcy as a result of some of those alleged habits. Uh, do you think you took the future of video games a little more seriously than some of those people in those early years? Could you see the future opening up for it or were they just a bit more hedonistic? How, what, what was going on there? I think I, I don't think I was any more visionary than they were. I think they just screwed it up. They just screwed it up. Uh, they just screwed up. <laughs> they, they, you know, they were, for the most part, they were enthusiasts like I was. Most of them did not have strong business degree backgrounds like my brother did. You know, I actually look back on my career and go, you know, I probably could have had a perfectly good career as a game designer working publishing through other people, but I wouldn't have had anywhere near the success I've had if I didn't have my brother as my business partner. Um, the uh, the majority, not not maybe not the majority, but at least half, I think, of those early companies had a similar tragic arc of people made a lot of money early on. They did not know how to invest that for their own future. They became all giddy and happy with it. And whether it was drugs or alcohol or other just ways to squander money, most of those or half of those early companies just squandered that windfall to their own you know, demise. And that happened but, you know, across the board, hardware, software, you know, magazines. You know, this was just – it was super common. I was actually quite shocked. I mean when I – you know, having growing up right next to NASA – of course, that sort of stuff was non-existent. And, you know, I would fly out to California and I'd go in for magazine interviews and I would literally go into uh, offices with glass, uh, you know, uh, uh, conference rooms. And I'd be in, in, a, in a conference room for an interview in full view of all employees in the rest of the building and people would be scratching out lines of cocaine on the tabletop uh, in full view. And and I'm just, you know, I'd be, at, I'm, a, I'm a teenager at this point. You know, I'm, I'm 16, 18 you know, years old. And uh, I'd just be looking around just in awe, just dumbstruck as to how this could, you know, not be an issue. And, mm -hmm. uh, but that's what, it, that's what it was like in those early 80s in California. Mm -hmm. 
Well, so you set up Origin Systems with your brother, away from all that craziness with the strapline, We Create Worlds. Uh, was this really a vehicle for Richard Garriott and his games, or did you have views to actually branch out and publish other people's, other designers' works from the off? Oh, no, it, from the beginning it was others also. Um, you know, even even uh, there were people that helped me, like uh, I mentioned this friend of mine that helped me draw this little you know character here at the top of this. Uh, that was Keith Zabalawi. He went on and still makes games himself. Uh, uh, he made a bunch of things with with Origin. Uh, my college roommate was a guy named Chuck Boucher, who was Chuckles, who was not only a character in Ultimas, but he went off and did a whole line of games himself. Uh, obviously, it was a big windfall when Chris Roberts, who made the Wing Commander series, you know, happened to wander in our doors as well. And so, uh, no, we were from the very beginning we had in mind and intended to publish for as many people as possible. Now, for the first 10 years of Origin, the Ultima series was dominant. Um, but, uh, but then eventually when, you know, Chris Roberts and Wing Commander came in, s suddenly and shockingly uh, to me, uh, <laughs> the Ultima series was no longer dominant uh, as Wing Commander kind of took over as our, our biggest seller. Yeah, you had an impressive roster of Origin employees. Names that stand out include, uh, I think, John Romero before its software yeah. was there. Uh, yep. Martin Goway. You've mentioned Chris yeah. Roberts, Warren Spector. So many great names. Was there something about Origin that attracted the talent, or did you have to actively go out and seek it? Uh, uh, there was actually something that we did early on that I think uh, gave us a reputation that uh, helped us attract a lot of these key creators. And that was something that started on accident. And, and it goes again back to the fact that Robert and I, as brothers, were co-founders of the company, because Robert would be trying to make decisions from a business standpoint purely. Uh, I, on the other hand, was an artist, and I wanted uh, decisions that felt right to me as uh, how to support myself and artists uh, as we go forward. And and here's how that would show up a lot in our contracts, starting with my own contract that I would debate with my brother. For example, uh, royalties back in these early days, and most of us, most of the authors that came to the company, including myself, were, were people who got paid on royalties. And let's suppose royalties might be, and back in these, the earliest days, they were the highest, there was something like 30%. And the theory of a 30% royalty, in my mind's eye, as an artist, would go, I'd say, okay, well, let's suppose this thing costs $10 to, to sell. Uh, let's, well, actually, I'm going to use $15 just for easier calculation. If we sold this for $15, uh, my third of it would be $5. The cost of goods to make it and you know physically sell it and maybe market it might also be about $5. And the company would keep about $5. And I'd go, you know, that seems like I'm putting in a lot of risk. The company's putting in a lot of risk. There's some physical hard costs. We're splitting it equally amongst those three things. Feels good to me as an as an artist, so I could support that. But then what would happen is you might sell a copy of your game in say Japan. Well, when a Japanese uh, licensor would sell a copy of the game in Japan, they would manufacture it themselves, sell it themselves, but then send a fee back to the United States. And in my mind, that fee already had the cost of goods taken out when it was sold in Japan. And so the fee that comes back from Japan should probably be split 50-50 between me and the company because the marketing and manufacturing's already been covered. To which Robert would go, well, yeah, that might feel fair to you, but that's not what's normal in business. If you go to like, say, Electronic Arts, they would still only pay you your 30%. And I'm going like, well, that's not fair. And they're going like, well, the definition of fair is what you negotiate. And if the business standard is you still get 30% and we pay more, it's a disadvantage to us as a business. And you're an owner of this business. And so you should want not just your what's good for you. You want the company to retain this value because you're a shareholder and this, you know, that's even worth more to you. And I'm going like, well, yeah, but it's not fair. I'm still standing by the author's rights and I'm pushing for mine. And, and so what happened is I sort of became the author's advocate within this structure. And because I was paid the same in the same way. In fact, when Chris Roberts came to Origin, he'd go like, well, I want to make sure Richard doesn't get a special deal because he's an owner. I want to see his contract. And that's where I'm starting my negotiation. And so I generally got the worst deal, but I was also an owner. You know, if, in the long run, I was still going to do fine. But from a royalty standpoint, everyone got as good or better a deal than I did. 
because that was the start of the negotiation. But that really meant that the company was super author oriented, uh, which which is why so many authors, I think, really uh, appreciated the, that dynamic. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Uh, Ultima 3 closed the first trilogy and the Age of Darkness draws to a close and we move into the Age of Enlightenment uh, which covers the Ultima games 4 through to 7. Uh, there's a massive technical difference between 4 up to 7. Uh, what are some of the more technical aspects of the games in this period that you're proud to have brought to the genre or just video games as a whole? Well, you know, what, what still happened during this period... It, it, it was right about so Ultima Four was uh, particularly special in mm -hmm. that it was the first time I could sit down and go, you know what, coding it is no longer the problem. Whatever the language is that we end up using, I'll figure it out. You know, I'm good enough at structuring stuff. You know, whatever problem we're trying to solve, we'll we, we'll figure all that out. I now need to actually make a a good game. You know, what am I trying to do with games? What am what am I trying to say? What am I trying to prove? It is obvious it's going to go on for a while. I mean, Ultima 1, 2, and 3 only connect to each other because I looked backwards and said, well, I guess i got to pick up wherever it is I randomly left off and let's continue, sort of. I mean, they're not even that well tied together. You know, Ultima 1 is uh, uh, in my D&D &D world. Ultima 2 is on Earth because I needed time travel, so I needed a contextual frame for tra travel. Uh, Ultima 3 goes back to my D&D &D world. You know, Ultima 4 is when I finally said, okay, look, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to get rid of the Balrogs from Tolkien. I'm going to get rid of the, you know, the orcs also from Tolkien. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to get rid of the lightsabers and land speeders from Star Wars. You know, I'm going to make my own world. I'm going to actually do, I'm going to make my own game from scratch and my own world from scratch. And I, and I thought a lot about, you know, uh, the fact that people weren't being good guys in my game. I knew I wanted to make a game that had these ethical parables in it. But if you're doing a game with ethical parables, I said, look, it's important you're playing yourself, not an alter ego. Because if you're playing your, you know, in D&D, &D, D &D campaign, you can play um, an evil wizard. And if you're playing an evil wizard or if you're being Conan the Barbarian, you should be expected to act like an evil wizard or expected to act like a moral Conan. And, uh, and so if I'm going to do a game about ethical parables, it's important that you feel guilty if you do something bad. And so I began to do all kinds of philosophical research, moral research. Uh, uh, you know, even though I was never a student of philosophy or history in school, suddenly I had a reason to care and immediately became a passionate, uh, a voracious consumer. In fact, behind me on the shelves back there is still my tons of my ethics uh, research library. Um, uh, I, you know, the, the commitment I put into creating quality uh, went up uh, dramatically. Uh, but along with that, still kept, I, I had, I now have enough history to where, you know, if you look at my earliest competitors with Ultima, they were games like Wizardry, Bard's Tale, Might and Magic, all of which are great games. I'm not in any way knocking them uh, with the following comment. But one of the things that I did differently in those early eras than many of them did in those same early eras is if they had a great selling game and their early games often sold better than the earliest Ultimas. But the way they would create a sequel is they would sort of say, hey, I've got a good engine now. Let me add in some new monsters and some new dungeon levels and release version two. And if you do that, the people who want to buy version two generally are a subset of the people who bought and enjoyed version one because it's sort of more of the same. You're not picking up new customers. You're selling to the old customers. On the other hand, with the Calabeth Ultima one, two and three, these were markedly better games. And the audience grew and grew. They generally doubled with each of my releases. And so that was not lost on me. So, I was going, so, so what started as an accident of I was really just doing it to better my craft now became design. And I said, OK, I need to make sure that I push the envelope everywhere I can. It's that not only was the storytelling and while I pulled in the word avatar to, you know, to be the, 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 the your character, uh, that I pulled from the Sanskrit word and the Hindu religions as I was doing philosophical re re research. Um, I then also sat down and said, okay, I want, you know, uh, I need my characters to be more alive. So I need to sit down and I, my, my characters ought to react to your behavior, whether that's good or bad behavior. They need to uh, have a daily life. 
that they go through. They need to wake up in the morning and go farm, tend their fields or go fishing or whatever it is and come back into town and sell stuff. Uh, so that, so that the world has a reality to it with or without your presence. Um, and there are all these sort of things about how can I take this reality crafting and not only make the world more and more real, but, uh, make your participation more and more relevant. And just as importantly, the participation of the bad guys, the bad guys needed to be worthy of being your antagonist. I mean, they can't just sit around and wait for you to come kill them when you become powerful enough, when you min max your way to the top, they've got to respond to your, to your behavior in a way that makes you actually second guess, what should I really do? Cause I'm getting people, if I convince somebody to help me, maybe that person will be get murdered because they helped you. And so I really started to take the craft much, much more, uh, seriously on, on all fronts. Yeah, on that subject, um, the subject of morals, in the official book of Ultima, which was written, I think, by Shay Adams and yourself, yep. uh, you mentioned that there's a scene that you, even your own mother asked you to remove in Ultima 5 to do with children and dungeons. Tell us about that. <laughs> oh, yeah. So uh, uh, this, was, uh, uh, yeah, this, this was a very interesting moment that, that has repercussions to my work to this day, um, which is... Uh, we were getting ready to publish Ultima Five. We were literally days away from what is, was referred to as the Gold Master, you know, the the, the version that would be copied uh, on the machines. And uh, uh, and one of our employees wrote a letter to my brother that he read, uh, and then came storming into my office, you know, all up in arms, and was like, "Richard, how in the how? What did you do with Ultima Five? What did you do in this game that is?" creating this reaction. And I'm going like, what reaction? What are you talking about? And he says, and the letter basically says, I refuse to work for a company that so clearly supports child abuse. And Robert's going like, what in the world did you put in this game that has created this reaction? And I'm going like, I actually have no idea. I can't even imagine what this person could be talking about. So we go to this employee and we're going like, wow, what, what has set you off in this incredibly extreme way? And, um, uh, and he describes that what it is, is it's one of the dungeon rooms near the very end of the game, literally the final push to the very end. There is a, a little dungeon room and it has cages in the corners and the cages are full of children and there's a lever in the middle of the room. And if you switch the lever, the cages are removed and the children are actually monsters and they're, but they're all the way around you purposely I put them all the way around on purpose and they swarm and attack you. And I had put them in there going, it's in the final push, you're, you, you, you can't do anything unvirtuous or you'll have to start that section over. And so I knew the player would not want to kill the children for fear of losing their, their moral standing. And, uh, and so I thought, oh, what a fun little test. It, wasn't, it actually wasn't a test. They're monsters. You actually could kill them. But I, but I just thought, ha ha, this will be a funny trick for the, you know, for a, a mental quandary for the, for the player and put it in. But this person clearly thought somehow I was encouraging you to harm children. And so they were somehow incensed. And my brother's going like, Richard, you have to take this out of the game because this would, you know, if this happens in the general public, you know, we'll be crucified as a company. And I was like, no, 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 you don't get it. This guy's wrong. You know, for not only is he wrong in the sense of don't throw the lever, just walk out of the room, charm the children and they'll walk away, put them to sleep and you can walk past them drop your sword and punch them in the face. They'll be hurt and they'll run away. Uh, or by the way, they're monsters that happen to look like children. If little vampire children are coming and biting at your heels, kill them. And I'm going, you know, it's, there's, there's no quandary here. This person is really just wrong. And frankly, I'm thrilled that I've actually created an emotional response in a game. The fact that I had created this level of kind of emotional tag and to me meant that I had had a real success in some sense, an important sense of the word. And he said, no, no, you have to take it out. I'm the publisher. I insist we're not publishing this game unless you take it out. And I'm going like, well, good luck then. I'm not taking it out. And you can't. So uh, you, you can not publish it if you wish. But, you know, it's due here in a week. So, you know, good luck with your decision. And so he went to the board of directors, which was him, me and my parents. And he got the, the he got my parents to try to, to convince me to take it out. And when we ever had these board fights before. My dad always took my brother's side and my mom always took my side, except this time. And when my mom actually went to their side 
And she said, Richard, it's only one room. Surely you can take it out. It's no big deal. You sure wouldn't want good housekeeping or whatever to come out after your game for this one room. Surely it's not worth this level of argument over one room. And I said, yes, it is. I said, this, this room is staying in the game. I'm proud of it. I think it's exactly the right way to, that this could be in there. We're leaving it in. In the end, of course, I, I won that battle. Uh, it did stay in, and no one ever complained about it. And so um, when you started that answer by saying this had a profound effect on future game making decisions, the effect was more of that, please. No, not less of it. Yes, exactly. More <laughs> of that. And so there is the room, the homage to killing children room in every game I've ever done since. <laughs> well, we've got the first question here from a viewer. Um, it's from Tim. He says, having recently finished Ultima 4 and 5 for the first time, I would be interested to hear if you still respond to people who report their feet, as it says on the final screens for the games. Absolutely, I do. In fact, uh, I still have the uh, a source artwork of the um, certificates that we would send to people when they would report their feet. And what I tell people now is I will respond in kind to however you report your feet. So on Twitter, if people rip, take a screenshot and send me their their completion of and by the way, if you if you you know in the book, in the last page of the book, it even says, if you've bought this book and read it, please report your feet. So it I have does, I still have it does, yes. But, <laughs> and so when people tell me that when people email me and or text me or tweet me that says they read the book, I respond in kind. So whether it's the book or any of my games, if you report your feet, I will respond in kind. So if people send me a letter, I respond with one of their hand signed certificates. If they send me an email or a tweet or whatever else, I respond with email or tweet or whatever else. Fantastic. Fantastic. To this day. Um, you mentioned earlier how other companies uh, would build an engine and reuse the engine. Uh, when we come to Ultima 6, we see Savage Empire and Martian Dreams games released, which utilize the Ultima 6 engine. Is this a point in the series where development becomes a process of build an engine first and then an Ultima game later? Or was that just a, a side effect that these extra games were... Well, it's sort of a transition. Money. Yeah, yeah. You no, know, you're. It's in transition period. You know, if you think about it now, if you th you know today when you think of you know uh, the Unreal Engine, you know the mm -hmm. Unreal Engine iterations of it are improved with the next generation of Unreal as often as they might be independently. <clears throat> and there's others that are done fully independently, whether it's uh, you know the Cry Engine or others. Some, sometimes now they're done independent of games. But at least, uh, so what this represents in Ultima Six is this period where. Um, you know, we've gone from, you know, seven weeks of after school time to by the time we get to Ultima 6, it's about two years to make an engine, to make a game. And two years is a long time and it's a lot of money. We're now the cost going into Ultima 6 was, well, you know, by today's standards, it's negligible, but it was probably, uh, you know, a million or two million bucks that would go into the construction of that game over two years. And that two year time frame is a long time to wait between products. And it's a big investment that may or may not pay off. And, and so the company is beginning to feel, all companies are beginning to feel this pain associated with rebuilding engines from scratch every time is a pretty expensive habit to keep up. And so what we did with Ultima 6 is we said, okay, you know, well, the pressure from people like my brother Robert, who weren't the artist, was like, why don't you do what everybody else is doing and just, you know, build two games out of one engine? And I'm like, nope, ain't, that ain't happening. Um, but but I did allow others in the company to tear apart the game and build a new game. And so that's what Savage Empire and Martian Dreams were, is attempts to extract Ultima 6 from the engine and then build a new game instead. Now, as good as those games were, they actually the reviews on, on Savage Empire and especially Martian Dreams was, were very good. And the sales were OK. And it helped kick off the career of people like Warren Spector uh, and others who, who, who became really great developers in their own right. But because it was the same engine, it didn't achieve the same sales as the original. And so that's why in Ultima 7, you saw us take a different tack. In Ultima 7, we actually made an Ultima 7 Part 2. Because we concluded that part of the expense of making Savage Empire and Martian, Martian Dreams was extracting Ultima from the engine. And so, and, and that made Savage Empire and Martian Dreams not really much more cost effective than writing a new one from scratch, frankly. Uh, and so we did Ultima 7 Part 2, which, by the way, if you compare those two, most people would review Ultima 7 Part 2 as a better game than Ultima 7 Part 1. 
However, it didn't sell better than Ultima 7 Part 1, again, because of this, in my mind, part of this engine reuse uh, question. Uh, and so, but, the, but those, those were origin trying to find its footing for how to uh, take advantage of engines or how to make, you know, and eventually what we did is uh, we moved even further beyond that to say, uh, you know, we should not be in the engine business. We should be in the, uh, in the, uh, in the content business. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ultima seven is the reason I bought a PC. Uh, Ultima six, I was playing on the Amiga uh, with, I actually played it with two floppy disk drives. I didn't have a hard drive, which meant I had to disable the music because every time the music changed in Ultima 6, it needed disk 3. So you had to swap the disks out. But uh, eventually, Ultima 7, I had this glossy origin newsletter with a spread about um, Ultima 7. And it had that famous opening scene with the dismembered gargoyle all over it. And I had that on my wall for months until I could finally get a PC. So I got that. And many did consider Ultima 7 to, to be peak Ultima. Where do you stand on that assessment? Well, de de there's no question that Ultima 7 is um, uh, uh, one of three that, that I have as my favorites. And, and if you think of the peak completion of Ultima, in other words, the, the, the total package of what an Ultima aspired to be, Ultima 7 probably is it. Uh, but I would, the other two that I'd put in that same pantheon are Ultima 4, uh, just because of the, for its time, sort of the radical uh, step forward, I, I believe that one made, and then Ultima Online. And so, uh, but those three to me are the standouts, Ultima 4, Ultima 7, and Ultima Online. Mm -hmm. And the popularity of the series meant it was being ported to many, many systems, including things like the FM Towns in Japan, uh, where in 1991, Ultima 6 was released on CD with fully digitized voices. Were you involved in this or any of the other ports or was it mainly outsourced? Most of the ports were outsourced, but not all. There were a few that were done in in house, uh, and that changed year to year. It was not based. It was whether they were done in house or out of house was sort of a complex mix of who was available in house. Meaning, you know, if we had somebody who was really an Amiga person, really wanted to do work on the Amiga, was close at hand, then we would give that to somebody in house, just because that would be a lot easier to help manage quality and speed to you know get a, as good a version done as possible. On the other hand, it was like FM Towns. I mean, no one in the States had one. And so uh, there was really no point in trying to bring that expertise in-house. So we let that be done fully out of house. So it, it was kind of a and, – and each game kind of went through that same decision process independently because it was generally two years later. Um, you know, a lot of change in this industry in two years. Uh, during the, it, it still does. Uh, it, but, but even back then it was. Is it, is it your voice in the FM Towns one? I can't remember if it is. Uh, the Lord British voice is. Lord British I think it is. Voice it is. Yeah, the Lord British voice is, yes. And then there was the Super Nintendo Ultima 7. Did you have any involvement right. in that? That was a very uh, odd one. Quite, quite cut down, wasn't it, compared to the PC version? Yeah, well, you know what's interesting is I have also uh, you know, another one of the ones I keep in, in, in my kind of short stack of favorites. I also keep this, a Game Boy, the Game Boy version. And... Uh, uh, and the reason why I keep this one around has to do with uh, uh, something I feel about ports, which is that, you know, since I was writing them on either an Apple II and eventually the PC, <clears throat> you know, I was optimizing for the platform that I was writing it on, right? I was often cheating, you might say. I mean, I was literally taking hardware tricks to make the game do whatever I could make, figure out a way to make it do on that very specific hardware. And so pretty much any other platform you take it to would lose something. You know, there'd be some aspect of it that'd get hobbled by that port. You know, even little things like, uh, you know, I'd optimize, you know, on, on the Apple II, the graphics are 14 pixels by 16 pixels. And so even if you're doing something like making a random dot pattern for grass, if you change onto a machine that has 16 pixels by 16 pixels, a pattern would show up. You know, that I would that I'd worked really hard to get rid of that pattern in 14 by 16. And, and unless somebody spent the same amount of love in, at the time they made it into 16 by 16, new patterns would show up that I had worked so hard to get rid of. And so, I mean, whether it's subtle or big, porting would often, in my mind, ha harm the original. Mm -hmm. uh, and and so I was I was honestly never that happy with with ports. But something very interesting happened when we thought about taking it to the Game Boy, and uh, 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 which is that uh, uh, it, the, the, this machine was really, you know, this tiny machine 
was clearly not capable of a true port. I mean, the amount of memory on board and graphic size and everything was so negligible, there was no way to pick a particular Ultima and literally port it. Instead, what you had to do is go like, what's important about Ultima? What is the essence of Ultima? And how do I make that on this machine? And uh, 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 Gary Smith, the guy that did this work, was uh, you know somebody we worked with in-house and worked on many of the Ultimas alongside me through, for many years. He took on the challenge of making the Game Boy Ultima. He built it from scratch, and it's great. It's, in my mind, one of the best Ultimas, period, because it was not a port, because it was a let me envision what Ultima would be like using this tool. And, and so to me, this was a real lesson for um, you know, how to make things on different platforms, which is don't literally port. Just imagine what's the best version you can make. Fantastic. I refurbished a Game Boy recently with a with a better screen, with a bit backlit screen. So I'll give that a go. To take a Ultima in isolation might be the perfect game. Excellent. <laughs> um, I've got another question here from a viewer from Jarno. He says, was the writing process of Ultima 7 akin to Stan Lee's Marvel method? I mean, did Richard Garriott give the lead writer, Raymond Benson, an overall summary of what he wanted in the game? And then Benson, along with the rest of the writing team, took care of the rest? Or were you more heavily involved in the actual writing of the story there? Uh, by the time I get to 7, uh, you know, uh, uh, that Stan Lee method, uh, which I had not heard of before, but that's, that, is, that sounds extremely familiar. So that, that is basically what we did. By the time we get to Ultima 7, and definitely by the time we get to Ultima Online, um, these games are now so big that no one person can know everything. I mean, there's, it's just not possible. I couldn't know where every tile was placed on the physical map of the world. I couldn't know the, even the total number of NPCs that existed in the game. Uh, there's no way any one person could know the totality. And so my job, by the time we get to really, it's somewhere between five, six, and seven, somewhere in that window, I become the person setting goalposts, and the team begins to execute toward those. And, and the Ultima 7 team, uh, I think, did a particularly good job of everybody taking up their individual uh, areas of expertise and pushing them as far as humanly possible. Did Richard Garriott ever get Ultima fatigue? Was there any of that ever set in or not? Uh, you know, there really wasn't. I mean, even <laughs> to this, you know, the, the closest I would have to that is, is I would say, you know, nowadays games are so big. Teams are so big. They take so long. There's so much money involved in the making of one that that looking at the, at the beginning of the process, it, it's pretty daunting to think, OK, let's once more into the fray, it's going to be a five year slog. Let's go. And so that's actually, you know, why, uh, you know, I, I'm not sure how many, if any. Uh, fresh starts I really have left in me just because it's it's just become uh, much more work than than play nowadays in, in my mind. So Ultima 7 was released in 1992. That's the same year that Electronic Arts acquired Origin for $35 million in stock. But I understand relations with EA hadn't always been the best to the point where there were more than just a few passing references to EA in Ultima 7. Do you want to share with us some of the EA Easter eggs or uh, hidden EA references in Ultima 7? Oh, oh yeah. So what what was funny about uh, Ultima Seven and EA is that the EA references in Ultima Seven were put in long before we started discussions with EA about becoming part of EA. And so part of our part of those negotiations of of acquisition had to include me confessing that oh by the way you know unless we change it when Ultima Seven is released under the EA umbrella. It's going to come out and be pretty much a slap in the face on EA. What do you guys think about that? And I, so I explained a lot of these Easter eggs to them, and they actually thought they were pretty funny. So they 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 endorsed uh, <laughs> Ultima Seven coming out with these. But but it includes things like uh, uh, the the main three evil artifacts in the game: the sphere, the cube, and the tetrahedron uh, were chosen. Uh, as you know, the falsehood, hatred, and cowardice, the three anti-principles that in, uh, in Ultima, but also happen to be the three main shapes of the Electronic Arts logo. <laughs> and uh, and the two of the main characters, Elizabeth and Abraham, EA, are the, these two particularly horrible uh, characters. And uh, and there are, uh, you know, the, the most nefarious pirate to sail the seven seas was a guy named Pert Snickwa, which is Trip Hawkins spelled backwards. <laughs> it was the 
uh, one of the founding uh, CEOs of, of, uh, of Electronic Arts. Uh, but yeah, but it goes very, very deep. I mean, Ultima 7 is just basically, you know, a Yusaki A kind of uh, <laughs> commentary uh, uh, that, that I had to very sheepishly go before them going like, well, hey, you know, something before you acquire us and publish this game, you might want to know these kind of things I have to say about the company. Uh, but 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 the reason why they thought it was OK and I left it in and and uh, things of this nature was that uh, it really was a commentary about a time of EA and certain people at EA who the only reason we even talked, we, we were willing to engage in these discussions with EA is those people had left EA. And so uh, I still think some of those problems with EA are systemic, you know, and and, you know, continued before, during and after uh, our presence. Uh, but, uh, but a lot of the very specific jabs, uh, were, uh, at, at people who were no longer present. Um, that same year, 92 also saw this, the release of Ultima Underworld. I know I'm, I'm kind of focusing on Ultima. There's a whole lot more to origin than Ultima, but, uh, there's only so much time that we can, we can fit in. So I'm just trying to follow that thread today, but with Ultima Underworld, um, viewer Stephen Eddy has a, a good question. He says, where did the groundbreaking technology behind Ultima Underworld come from? It came out so many years before other true 3D games. Uh, yeah, well, credit for that really goes to Paul Nurath, who is the you know producer of that, uh, and he's uh, uh, still doing Underworld Ascendant, uh, you know, right now. Uh, but you know, while Ultima, or even going back all the way, you know, a Calabath, you know, uh, arguably you know championed 3D in role playing games all the way back at the very beginning. But pretty quickly, if you look at the, those first three Ultimas, you know, there was not only 2D above ground, 3D underground, and even sort of perspective view space flight uh, in some of the earliest Ultimas. There was basically every kind of thing I could throw in one game at a time in there. But over time, I had to go like, well, what? You know, I, I can't really put in multiple engines. You know, it's hard enough to put in one engine. Putting in multiple engines is a, is a waste. Uh, and which the one that serves me the best and that I can do the best. And the tile graphics sort of became my main uh, anchor point because it served the storytelling that I was trying to do the best, I felt. Um, I still was a fan of 3D. We still often included 3D in some of the dungeons and other places, but the, the tile graphics were the place that I pushed because it was also the – technologically, it's what I felt I could push with my particular individual skill set. Um, but when Paul Nuras showed up and said, hey, I really want to take us back into this fluid 3D, it's not just the move forward 10 feet at a time, but a true fluid 3D and even have an interface where you're swinging your sword, you know, directly, uh, you know, much more viscerally. And what that sword physically contacts is the thing that gets hit. Uh, all of us were very excited about it. Um, and, uh, but we also knew how hard it was. So, you know, we, we, and, until he sort of proved he could do it, uh, you know, I think a lot of us were skeptical it could be done, but as soon as Paul began to show his, the results of his code, it was obviously he was onto something really big and important. And, and by the way, that also happened with Chris Roberts. You know, when, when Chris Roberts, uh, when he first joined us, he did a couple of, of fantasy role-playing games, uh, Tangled Tales and a few other, uh, things. Uh, and, uh, and those were good, but when he showed us Wing Commander, his, you know, you know, Chris, Chris has this habit of he will noodle on a game, write some code for it in isolation by himself, and then he'll kind of show a demo and see what, see what people think. And so when Chris emerged and showed this little demo that had music in it and started as a cutscene of a guy going da 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 running down a hallway jumping the the cockpit opens up he swings into his tie fighterish you know vehicle the canopy closes down again the camera rotates to looking out the front canopy zoom you launch out of the launch tube and now you are literally flying around in 3d space seamlessly instantaneously we knew that was a hit i mean literally went from no one had ever seen hide nor hair of it at all except chris working on his own in his closet and the first moment the rest of us saw it we're going that is going to be a runaway bestseller, and we all knew it. And and so to go back to Underworld, it was a similar case. 
where uh, as soon as Paul showed this, we were going, okay, this is, a, this is going to be a big winner. Hmm. It really was a technical marvel compared to, say, the, the flip page dungeon crawlers like Dungeon Master and games of that ilk. Was there ever a chance that the main Ultima series that might then turn into a first-person affair using that technology, or was that always going to be a, a sideline? Um, what, the, 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 it could have gone either way. I mean, I don't think we ever sat down and said, should we necessarily do it? Um, but that was the kind of a discussion of, you know, each new Ultima, we'd sit down and go, what, what is the technological base that we're going to want to use this time? Uh, mm -hmm. it, the, the reason why they never did go that way, <clears throat> at least for, you know, my rationalization at the time, and I still sort of feel this way, is I really felt it was important to be able to take small items like the ring that I'm holding here and, you know, see it on the tabletop and be able to pick it up and interact with it. And especially still back in the days of, of Underworld, you know, the, the pixel count was still pretty terrible on a screen. And as soon as you put that ring in perspective and distance, you know, you're not going to see it. It's going to be a single pixel somewhere on the floor. You, know, you won't be able to detect it. And so I felt still that the kinds of interactions that I wanted to have, the kinds of detail of touch that I wanted to have within the world itself uh, required the tile graphics more than 3D. It did lead to some really fun interactions. Like you said earlier, the first thing people wanted to do was murder everyone in the game. But you could go to the baker, steal the bread, murder the breaker, the baker, put them in a sack, put the sack in a in a a, a chest, you know, stick that on a boat. It, it was wonderful what you could do with it. Um, Chris Lord has a question which ties in with that. He says something that made um, we're coming on to Ultima Online here, but it, it does apply to um, other Ultimas. He says, something that made UO great was the true persistence. Put something on the ground and it stays there. Um, there were player runs towns. You could buy deeds to houses, buy and sell boats, keep pets, bake, tailor, steal, kill. The level of interactivity was completely unparalleled. He says he was disappointed when he first tried World of Warcraft that it didn't seem to make any difference whether he was in the world or not when compared to Ultima. Um, do you have any theories on why other online games haven't tried to replicate that level of interactivity online or offline, really, because it did apply throughout all of Ultima? Uh, yeah. And, you know, what's interesting is, um, uh, first, I agree with that. Um, but what's interesting is that, uh, you know, Ultima, as, 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 as strongly as I feel that we did the best Thing we could for what we were trying to create from an artistic standpoint. It's important to know that what we were trying to make was great art. What we were not trying to do was achieve great sales. And, and that's important to separate that. I actually think that generally speaking, if you make great art, great sales periodically follows that, but not always. And Worlds of Warcraft is is an interesting case study. First of all, it is great art. I'm by no means trying to knock their art. I think it's phenomenally good art in any way, shape, or form. But there are certain things that World of Warcraft does so much better than I think I could ever do with any of my games that I'm in awe of it. So for example, their challenge and reward cycle is incredibly well-tuned. Meaning, you know, you are level one and, and, and you are fenced in by level two creatures and problems until you do the level one quest sufficiently to become level two. And now you're gated into a slightly larger area of the world. But now the level three monsters are a fence that you cannot penetrate and you have to grind in the level two till you become level three. And, uh, and their balance of that, the amount of time you have to spend in one before you get to the next one, the, the psychological metaphors that are done in slot machines of, you know, uh, I'm sure all of us who are into games have heard these things about, you know, if you if you put a chicken in a cage where if it pick, pecks on a lever, it gets a piece of food. If it's guaranteed they'll get the food, they pick on it periodically. But if it's only a 50-50 chance you get the piece of food, they'll pick on it forever. I mean, they'll, because they, you know, they don't know when the food won't be there, you know, or for whatever psychological reasons you keep pecking on it. So there are people in, in this industry, including Blizzard, who who do this the science of, of challenge reward cycles far better than I do. Uh, but also that's not what I'm here to do, right? I, I wanna, I'm here to create a world. I'm here to create this living, breathing place because that's just what I'm motivated to do. That's just what I enjoy creating and enjoy living within. And I've shared that same kind of odd frustration 
Uh, mine actually came when we uh, were doing some work with a Korean company, uh, NCSoft, and they have uh, a, a game uh, that, um, uh, uh, that that sold particularly well in Korea uh, that, uh, uh, that we were looking at here in the United States. And when you first boot it up, it looks a lot like Ultima. It was inspired by Ultima Online. They told us that was what they were looking at when they made it. Uh, uh, we brought it here to the States uh, to go try to, to look at it. Uh, it was much more beautiful than Ultima Online. You walk in, you see a, a chest sitting on the ground. I go to click on it to open up, see what's in it. And I realize it's not a chest that you can open. It's just a piece of the backdrop. And then you go to like the fish on the table and you're going like, oh, it's just a piece of the backdrop. And then you go talking like you go clicking around madly to try to find things to interact with. And you realize it's all just part of the backdrop. And, and you're going like, oh, well, this is absolutely the antithesis of Ultima. But by the way, it looks beautiful. And so, uh, uh, you know, by no means am I trying to say that what we do with Ultima necessarily will be the best selling because it's very commonly not. However, it's what we enjoy doing. And I think one of the reasons a lot of people don't like if you say, why didn't Lineage and why didn't World of Warcraft also put in the stuff that we put in? I think the answer is because it's a pain in the butt and it, it takes an enormous amount of time and energy. It means you can't do the best on some of these other areas. And some of those other areas actually create better sales by definition of looking at the sales of those other products. And so uh, I think uh, it's just the art we chose to make and, you know, either love it or leave it. But uh, that was our goal. Mm -hmm. So Ultima, let's let's talk about Ultima 8 and 9 quickly. They took a different turn with Ultima 8 becoming uh, a bit more of a solo adventure. And Ultima 9 took us into 3D, Ultima 9 here. Um, both requiring uh, patches after release, if you don't mind me saying, just to make them a bit more of a finished experience. Do you think Ultima 8 and 9 would have been better games if they weren't produced under EA's roof? If they were not produced under yes, EA's roof. Yes, if they were not. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yes, that is correct. Uh, but, but, uh, but here's, but here's and, as, and, as, and as much fun as it might be to bash EA, and I do it myself periodically, um, it's not EA's fault. Uh, and let me explain that. Um, in, you know, when we were doing, uh, you know, we, we, we talked about, uh, you know, from Origins perspective with Ultima 6 and Ultima 7, we were trying to create spinoffs to the games were becoming so big and so much time between them that marketing was becoming a problem. Uh, shelf space was becoming a problem. The industry was maturing in a way that this is still before online Internet sales. So you had to companies had to have enough product flow to buy linear linear feet of shelf space at stores. And so unless you had a sufficient bulk of products, you couldn't get shelf space once every two years to sell something. You had to have something in there every month, something new in there every month. And so alone, Origin couldn't do it. So Origin had to, literally had to. We would be out of business had we not joined partners with some other larger company. So that's the first thing to know. Um, so then the question is only, who would we become partners with? We were we were about the number ten software company in the world, but you had to be top three, or you did not get shelf space. So we had to bulk up. So the question is: is which of the top three companies are we going to ultimately align with? What consortium of smaller companies could we put together? We tried that too to come up with. Better or worse, we selected EA. When we become part of EA, you know, EA said they're going like, okay, well. You know, you've learned some great stuff with what you've done as Origin. We believe we've learned some great stuff with what we've done as EA. Let's put that together and come up with a great plan. And one of the EA beliefs, I would say, came out of the fact that they were in this business of doing their, their best business was and probably still is their sports franchises. And they will take an engine like, let's say, football, and they will continue to make the football engine better and better and better and better forever. But then once a year, they sort of peel off the current state of the art of that engine and create a Madden 95, Madden 96, Madden 97, whatever it might be. And then and the engine keeps going. And they're going, the nice part about that is they have a football game at the beginning of football season every year. And therefore, it's on a regular cadence. The players know what's coming. There's easy to continue. The marketing fits in with the same as the football season. Everything works together beautifully from a marketing standpoint. And the game is actually getting better and better. And it's one of the best football games out there. So it works great. And they're going, like Richard, you know, five years between games is way, way, way too long. Not just a little too long, it is way too long. And there's people like um, 
uh, what's a game by um, uh, oh, uh, uh, there, there's some other first person shooter games right now that have two or three teams working independently on rotating cycles to try to make sure that uh, even okay, though so the likes of Call of Duty and that kind Call of, of Duty those yeah. are yes exactly yeah. they have multiple teams and and I'll get to my reason why I don't like that method here in a minute but the but that's a way to beat this same problem of five years is too long and so when we were working Ultima 8, I actually am very proud of what Ultima 8 was intended to be. It was basically going to be Ultima meets Diablo before Diablo. And uh, But as we got it to basically first playable, we were basically already way past time and in EA standpoint, way past money. And the pressure began to go like, wow, you're going to miss – your audience is going to wander off to go play your competitors' games – and there's going to be nothing left if you don't figure out some method to bring this in by not a small amount, but like at least a year earlier than we believe your current projection will take you to. And we discussed and debated this at long length, but nobody said you must do this or, you, or we will cancel your game or you must do this or you're no longer being part of our organization. Nobody did something inappropriate <laughs> like that. However, it's pretty convincing, right? I mean, they've got plenty of good data to show that their concerns are real. And so I incorrectly gave in to those pressures. And so the Ultima 8 map is nowhere near complete. The, in fact, the cloth map has almost nothing to do with the real world that you're playing in. The two-thirds of the story, or at least a th maybe somewhere between a third and two-thirds of the story, was basically just literally just removed. You know, we just, we just closed it early. Uh, and there were tons of bugs that managed to squeak through, like the difficulty of jumping and other things that they got criticized for pretty regularly, which we could immediately fix in a patch. But this is still before the Internet. And so it's, there's pat nobody gets patches. So it's so unfortunately, it shipped largely unfinished. And that was sort of the first big mistake that I made as a, a developer. By the way, that's not the first big. Day. That was one of a series of big mistakes <laughs> I made as a developer. Um, there have been others, like uh, you know, trying to bet on the Apple II when the PC took over. They, were, they nearly put us out of business uh, back in the Ultima Five time frame. But anyway, there's t there's plenty of other giant mistakes I've made, but that was that was one of the big ones. And so that takes us on then to, I mean, on my Ultima Nine CD here, it's actually advertising Ultima Online at the back. So you're juggling two games and what? Actually, it's Ultima Online: The Second Age on the back here. So Ultima Online came first in '97, I think. Yeah. And then Ascension in 99. Um, building a purely online world then, that must have presented its own challenges uh, that you'd never had to consider in a single player experience. Aside from the uh, well-known story of accidentally being assassinated in the beta. I think a lot of us know that story. What were some of the unexpected challenges that the new online world presented for you as a developer? Well, the first big challenge was just getting it going. And so what's interesting about Ultima Online and Ultima 9 is to see how their lives uh, switched places uh, multiple times in their existence. When Star Long, uh, who deserves the lion's share of the credit for Ultima Online, when, when Star and I sat down, now, now we, we Origin had been looking at doing a multiplayer Ultima since much earlier on. When we saw dial-up services like AOL and uh, you know, others, uh, you know, running some online games, um, you know, we, we'd look at those and go, the technology, the, the, the connection speeds are too slow. The costs are too high. The total audience is still too small, but almost every Ultima we'd sit down and look and say, is now the time to do an online game? Um, finally in, you know, 95, 96, me and Starlong got together and said, look, the World Wide Web is coming into existence. This is going to be the great equalizer. Now is the time we need to make this online game. And so we put together a proposal. We took it out to Electronic Arts, as you often do. Um, the way EA worked, and probably still works, is you'll not only put together your design plan, you'll put together your technical plan. That tells you how much it'll cost to make your projection to that. You hand all that to the sales department. They do sales projections. And then based upon how much is it going to cost to make versus how much you predicted to earn, they can do a return on investment and go, okay, we'll do that one. Well, when we pitched Ultima Online, there were no other online games. And so they said, well, the biggest things out there are like this Genie and AOL dial-up things. They have, you know, 5,000 players. And so 5,000 players compared to your million or two bucks you want to spend, there's no way that's going to make any money. No. 
And we were going like, oh, you guys just don't get it. You are wrong about the internet. And so we came back six months later and we said, we pitched the same game. We said, look, the internet is obviously coming online. There are some other online games now beginning to kind of be bubbled and talked about and kind of bubbling up. We would really like to do this game. They did the same analysis, came back with the same results, said no. Six months later, we bring back the same game and say, you know, you guys are idiots. We have to be making this game. They still told us no. And then I did something that was really the beginning of the end of my career at Electronic Arts, which basically I did the stomp my feet, hold my breath. We're not leaving the room until you let us go make this. And I actually wrote on a piece of paper to Larry Probst. I said, uh, Larry Probst authorizes uh, Star and Richard to go over budget at Origin by $250,000 to build a prototype of Ultima Online. And I said, we're not leaving this room until you at least give us $250,000. So $250,000 is the noise in our budget. You know, you will never notice if we go overrun by this amount of money. You have to at least let us go build this prototype. And, and very begrudgingly, Larry signed that and now said, just get out of my face. And, uh, and that began Ultima Online as the bastard stepchild product of Origin, to where as other people came into the company, and if Chris Roberts needed for Wing Commander, they went to Wing Commander. If Ultima 9 needed them, they went to Ultima 9. Only people that we could hire that would be of no use to other projects could come and join the Ultima Online team. It, and we were rebuilding a building, and the, literally the team had to like park in hallways during reconstruction. I mean, it was it's laughable how badly this team was treated right up until the beta became available. And when we we had spent our $250,000, so we had no money left, to even send people discs to be part of the beta. And so we put up what was Electronic Arts' first website. And it said, hey, we're the Multima, Ultima Online team. Uh, hey, if, you're, if you'll send us $5, we'll let you be in this little beta test. And within a week, 50,000 people had sent in $5 to become part of the beta test from a test website. And immediately, everyone got it. And so immediately, EA goes, well, now this is the most important thing happening in EA Worldwide. Tons of help came, uh, and EA also tried to do the next thing, which relates to Ultima 9, which is they tried to cancel Ultima 9 immediately, and I refused. I basically said, you guys are jerks that have been, frankly, jerking me around that wouldn't let me do the other one, and now you're demanding I shut down the one I've been working on for more than a year. Uh, I said, I'm not going to do it. We're going to do them both, and, and so that began this fight, which continued through the release of Ultima Online. But then Ultima 9 also required literally a fight. EA was no longer interested. Literally, they were no longer interested in solo player Ultimas. So the only reason Ultima 9 was finished at all was because I was unwilling to cancel it. I must go back and play through Ultima 9. Um, I got to a point on Buccaneer's Den where it just wouldn't register that I'd completed a task. And it wouldn't let me go further. And I know a patch had come out, but I didn't have a saved game that let me go back far enough. <laughs> And I'm uh, sure it's a, a common story, but uh, I must go back and patch it and play it at some point. Um, but you mentioned the beginning of the end for yourself um, at EA, and that end did come, I believe it was in 2000? I think so. In what you emotionally describe in the book as the end of my personal Camelot, Ultima remained the property of EA, a franchise you'd, you'd nurtured over 20 years. Where'd you go from there, Richard? Well, well, that was tough, mm. and um, you know, and I, and for years I've even reflected as to how I should have handled that because what what happened in those last years of Origin, um, as I think unfortunately has happened in a lot of studios that EA has acquired down through the years, is while the most successful EA executives stayed at headquarters, the people who bumped up against that glass ceiling at headquarters would get shuffled out to the remote studios, including Origin. And my brother had retired. He's an entrepreneur. He's only in it to be the entrepreneur. He had no interest in being a mid-level manager at Electronic Arts. So he was retired. And, and I was still wanting to make games, not run the business. And so every year that we were part of EA, literally each year, we had a new EA middle manager. Um, pretty much all of whom I would describe as useless. And, uh, and the reason why I would so, I'm so, uh, say that so strongly is not because they were bad people, but because they inevitably would come in and go, well, whoever my predecessor was, I'm not doing it their way. I have my own plan. 
and they would change management, change plans, change structure in their own vision. And at first, you're going to this trying to be as supportive and helpful as possible until you realize that you're making no progress. Again, since games take multiple years, if every year you tear down the plans and rebuild them, no one is making any progress ever. And so it began to be this thing to where instead of, after a few of these cycles, all of us get in, get in the mode of, we can't change tracks because some new person has come in who has no idea who we are, what we're doing, or why, and wants to just change things. And so we started beginning and building in some either resentment or resistance to people just knee-jerk changing things for whatever their inter internal reasons are. And so as I look back at the time where it was Jack Highstand who you know, came in and said, hey, Richard, I think it's about time you know, we part a company. You know, I don't know what would have happened if, if I had done my, like I did with Ultima Online, stomp my feet and hold my breath and say, no, you, you're, you're the newcomer. You know, uh, it's not me that's leaving. It's you that's leaving. Uh, I, I don't think it would have saved me or Origin at that point. But I don't think it, but even if I could have delayed that one moment, it, it, the writing had been on the wall now for some years. Uh, in the sense of it, it, there's no question that they're the EA sports franchise product cycle was never going to work for Origin, was never going to work for me. And so uh, there really was, you know, I, I don't think there's anything I could have really done about it. You can almost see that in the number of um, expansion packs that were released for Ultima Online after your departure. Uh, they just seem to keep coming and coming, uh, including packs that introduce things that just didn't sit right with me, things like Samurais uh, that weren't a part of the Ultima world before. Um, it did go off in a very, what I'll call EA direction. Um, you you went on to do more things. Um, I'm very conscious of the amount of time that you've generously given us today. So I'm going to skip forward a little bit to, uh, to Shroud of the Avatar to try and stick with the Ultima line. Um, Shroud of the Avatar, for us, for a start, is is it Ultima? Is Shroud of the Avatar Ultima? <laughs> well, legally, of course not. But uh, but if what you're saying is, is it is it a continuation of the design philosophy uh, that I had nurtured for decades? Absolutely, yes. And so I I, I very affectionately describe it as the uh, spiritual successor to Ultima. Now that being said, it's also a crowdfunded budget oriented property. You know, it, we didn't have, you know, the last Ultimas, uh, you know, cost, you know, hundred million dollars to make and, and Shroud of the Avatar cost us $20 million to make in a time when things generally cost more, not less. And so, uh, uh, but, but, but the team and the design absolutely is approached from the same principles that drove the, the rest of the development of the series, including going back to, we wanted to maximize the forward progress on it and all the important places we could, uh, both from a multi how to how to create a multiplayer, how to do storytelling. But, you know, Ultima Online, for all the great aspects of multiplayer, had almost no storytelling in it. It it actually benefited from all the story of the previous solo player Ultimas, but advanced almost no storytelling in its own. Um, and so with Shroud of the Avatar, we tried to bring that back into even a multiplayer setting. Um, we, uh, uh, <clears throat> from an NPC standpoint, you know, our characters with their lives and schedules and other things, we tried to again, push it to one more level of, of sophistication with our conversation systems with characters. We tried to again, take that to where it's not just, you know, two or three keywords you can ask, but much more free form, including bodies of knowledge that NPCs can inherit from regions or other people they can they can they can know uh parsing not exactly sentence parsing but more sophisticated parsing all those aspects uh as well as the care about virtues and ethical parables and everything we try to push really hard in shroud of the avatar and this uh, for those who don't know was kickstarted in 2013 ended up raising three million dollars thanks to the kickstarter and continued fundraising on the game's website itself uh, and it's still i think the last update that was released was only a matter of a week or so ago so it's still very much in active development it's out of the um sort of beta stage isn't it it's now oh absolutely version one and beyond um, that's correct we're, we're a year maybe a little more into version one um mm -hmm. working now on actually version two um but we actually release a new version of shroud of the avatar every month so there's literally precisely once a month there is a new drop of the of the game and uh, well, how's it going? 
Richard, how, how is Shroud of the Avatar going for you? Shroud is going very solidly uh, in, this, in the sense of uh, the team is well supported uh, by the community to keep it going on its monthly cadence. Uh, the next big push is for episode two uh, that, uh, uh, you know, uh, I, I'd hate to predict exactly when it, when, or, when it will or won't actually <laughs> show up as episode two, uh, but, uh, uh, but hopefully within this calendar year. Uh, but, uh, but no, we're, we're actually very pleased with the community that it has uh, gathered and the, uh, you know, you go back to, uh, when you're describing Ultima online about, you know, owning property within the world and building physical things within the world, the, that aspect of Shroud of the Avatar is one of the things that has done the best. The, the your ability to homestead bl- players ability to build entire towns, uh, and even build players can now even create uh, writing and full NPCs with conversations. Full maps of dungeons can be created not only by the in-house team but by the characters playing the game themselves too. And so uh, that really multiplies the uh, the creative you know uh, impact that players can have within the world. So we're we're actually very pleased with the uh, the resulting. Uh, you know, Lord British slash Ultima ish of the of the world that has been created. Do you ever drop into the game yourself? And, and oh yeah, I play. Around, yeah. Oh no, no, I'm in uh, most every month with the uh, with every release. Uh, all the developers get in and play uh, with the community at least s- some period of time, uh, and so uh, my, myself uh, amongst them. Uh, you know, Star Long uh, gets in and runs. Uh, one of the things we do to test each release is we have, we throw a big party, and and the reason we throw it as a party is that actually taxes the game a lot to get every all the players in one general area. Uh, high density populations are bad for the engine, you might say, or or a tax on the throughput of the tools. And so uh, he comes in and DJs a uh, dance party <laughs> uh, every uh, release. Uh, I'm usually in there for that too, but. Uh, uh, we then throw all the kinds of of, of events, uh, live events, uh, with the dev team throughout the year. Yeah, I think anyone who ever went to the bank in Britannia in Ultima Online will know how to tax a, a game in you know, yeah, exactly. <laughs> on dial-up. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, was there ever an opportunity to actually buy back the Ultima name for yourself and to, and to use that or not? No, you know, and in fact, um, um, EA in the recent decade has occasionally licensed out some of the properties that they had acquired uh, to those original creators that, that happened with Bard's Tale, happened with a few others. Um, we've actually discussed that down through the years with various execs at EA. Um, almost every time we start that up, we were initially met with the, wow, that's a really great idea. Why haven't we done this before? And then it gets floated around EA and somewhere within EA world, uh, there's some team or some individual who believes that they have ownership or intent to do something with the property which never actually seems to pan out, but uh, but it does end our discussion. So we bring it up regularly. It's turned down regularly. So um, let's just look back on your career in general then. Um, does your current development house uh, with Shroud of the Avatar, does that resemble in any way the early years of video game development, for example, when you set up Origin in 83? Or are we talking complete different worlds now when it comes to game development? Well, a little bit of both. I mean, the, in the sense of... Uh, I think that what we do, uh, and this is whether it's myself or Star Long or Chris Spears and you know others with that, that I work with these days, um, you know, we we still have that same idealistic approach to, you know, we're all in this together and um, we all still like the, uh, you know, if somebody has to set goalposts and other people then do their maximum individual creativity within that scheme to pull off as much as they can, uh, you know, pushing down control to, uh, to, to whoever is responsible, uh, to do any particular piece. We think that, uh, makes a better resulting product. And, uh, so, so those sort of, those sorts of management ideals, I think all of us still share individually, you know, uh, whether it's when we're working together and we're working separately, we still operate that way. And I think that means that, we always will continue to have this super collegial uh, community uh, of developers that, uh, uh, you know, even if we've become separated through the years, we always end up coming back together again. Um, the, 
On the flip side, uh, though, uh, the reality of game development is is that um, you know you you look at uh, I was looking at uh, like I'm a big fan of the Monument Valley series of, of games on uh, on your cell phone, and uh, I presume you can play them on PCs and things too. But I play them on my cell phone, and and it it it, it, it would be it's a simple enough concept for a game of kind of moving this geometry around and having your character walk through it. Um, that you could at least imagine taking that on as a small studio or a few person shop. But when you get to the end and you look at this list of credits and you see the hundreds and hundreds of names roll by, you it's just one of many examples of that there are no small games left anymore. I mean, there's periodically one that'll pop on the radar, but as a general rule, you know, games now are a big, expensive undertaking. Like a movie is a big, expensive undertaking. And, uh, uh, and so that's just the, the nature of the beast. And so that, that won't, you know, we, we will not recapture those early days uh, in the way that it was, but that's okay. We can, you know, as much as some of us might occasionally pine for the days when, you know, you could do all of this yourself in seven weeks of after school time, you know, in seven weeks of after school time, you could do something like this again, but it wouldn't be that interesting anymore. This is very interesting for its moment in time. It just isn't very interesting today. And so if you really want to make things that are relevant to people today, you have to be willing to play at the scale that is required today. And that generally, as a baseline, requires a lot of time, a lot of money, and a lot of manpower. Well, Richard, you mentioned this earlier, but I hope you have many, many more games in you yet, <laughs> regardless of how much money it takes and how long it, it, it takes you to make them. Thank you so much for taking the time with us today. So the games you created certainly influenced my life. Many of the, the viewers will have been influenced too. Um, I actually uh, never had a day without my ultimate manuals or law books in my school bag, I can tell you. All right, excellent. <laughs> I tried to be the cool kid on the surface, but I was always taking my <laughs> ultimate books out to have a little read. <laughs> oh, yeah. Thank you so much, Richard, for your time. My pleasure. Thank you. Great to be here with you again. If you enjoy my content and would like to support The Cave while receiving a completely ad-free experience and access to releases one week before they go public, then visit patreon.com forward slash retro man cave and join the official cave dwellers. Thank you for your support.